by your presence and by knowledge of your word. We love you and we thank you, Lord, for everything that you've done. Lord, we love you and we want to grow more and more intimate with you. We want to know you more. We want to experience you more. And we want you to experience us as well. Purify our mind, our heart, our soul, our spirit, so that we might be able to perceive and learn what you have for us tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we ask you, Lord, to be with us tonight and bless this time of study. Amen and amen. All right. So, uh, let me see. The last time we were here, I believe I was able to blow the shofar, right? Yes. All right. Awesome. So, let me find it. thought I had it. Oh, here we go. All right. You there? All right. We're going to go pretty quickly. We're, well, I'm still in uh, week eight, uh, the notes, okay? So, if you can pull those up, okay, I, I uh, send them to you or they're available on the, on the website. Uh, so we're going to go through these so we can get to uh, week 9. Uh, pray for me because I want to make sure I finish it. But that's a lot of information if you already looked at it. Uh, so let's go on. So we have here, uh, last time we were here, uh, I played for you the shofar. Uh, the shofar is made out of ram, uh, ram's horn. Uh, yes, they are real. And um, it is, this one is usually used or blown to announce uh, a change. A warning, uh, also to uh, announce warfare. And again, uh, the last thought that I had mentioned was, uh, is it important to use them? And some people are, are trying to use some of these uh, things from a uh, Hebraic background uh, in, in Christian worship. And some people are like, well, that's not really necessary because we're not under the law. But it's still something that God instituted in the Old Testament in regards to praise and, and, and spiritual warfare through praise. And it's important because although not everyone understands fully, and yet we can make time for them to understand it little by little, in the spiritual realm, it will produce results because the spirits have not died. The spirits have not uh, not known something within time. They've been around for all these ages, so they know exactly what this means. And not only that, it activates, just like certain things activate demonic activity. This activates angelic activity in behalf of the Lord, okay? Uh, here, uh, we're looking still at Psalms 150. There's different uh, instruments that are mentioned here. Here's one where it says, uh, praise him with a psaltery and a harp, okay? Uh, here's a, sometimes we have instruments and we read them in, in, uh, in the Bible and we don't really know how they look or how they sound. But pretty much it's almost like an abbreviated harp or uh, what we would call almost like a little guitar. Uh, here we have uh, more. The, the one here to the left is the one that is pretty, basically more uh, commonly seen in uh, ancient art, and, and we see it there. Uh, it's also uh, very common among uh, the Greek culture as well. Uh, the verse 4 says, Praise him with the timbrel and the dance. The timbrel uh, is more of what we would call like the tambourine. Uh, also, the drums can be considered the timbrel. Okay? And here we have uh, some of, uh, like, a, a modern praise team in, in, in a Christian church. And uh, there they are, uh, specifically with the timbrels or the tambourine, okay? Uh, we've got some different uh, little movements within the church where they dance more with tambourines. And it's called the tambourine ministry. And then uh, in the 90s, we had more of a resurgence when we were uh, seeing more of the flags. And, and, and we're going to talk about that soon, okay? And hopefully tonight. And then uh, we now we're seeing more as in more, um, more kind of like modern dance. But then we still see a little bit of the movements from the old Hebraic style of dancing and praising. And it comes uh, and it goes, okay? Uh, praise them with the, or, uh, the instruments, the string instruments and organs, the pipe instruments, the flutes, okay? It's like a flute-like uh, instrument. You see it? There's one that's string. Praise him with the loud symbols. That's not much to uh, kind of look at. Uh, and there is, like I tell you, a revival in uh, Hebraic style of worship in the 90s. We saw Paul Wilbur, uh, which is uh, still around. He's still around, but he's really old now. Uh, but he's the one that, uh, he uh, most popular one in the late, eight, late 80s that uh, he was singing. He is Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. He is Jehovah, the Lord who yielded me. Uh, that's, that's him. 
Uh, there's a, a movement of churches in Latin America by the name of Elim, okay, or Llamamento Final, and uh, they are Hispanic churches, but when you hear them and you see their praise and worship, they're dressed a lot with Hebraic uh, style or culturalistic uh, ways of dressing. Their praise and worship has a certain rhythm, okay? It, it almost sounds like you're, you're going to watch Fiddler on the Roof and they're dancing in that way, in that, that way as well. Palabra de Acción, uh, Inspiración, hit uh, record labels uh, and record sales by crazy in the late 90s, early 2000s, okay? The late prophet Gary Olds, okay, uh, he already went to be with the Lord, but he functioned in the miraculous and angelic visitations, by the way. When, he met, uh, when you hear him, he's a very calm guy, but when he would minister, he had a lot of angelic Manifestations, which is not very common, by the way, all right? But this is what he says in regards to uh, having this intimacy with God in regards to praise and worship. Intimacy with God is a simple means by which we access living in the miraculous. Spending time in His presence is a discipline we must develop to access all that God has for us and the cumulative effect is what happens in our anointing or gifting to function in healing or in, in any of the supernatural, okay? Uh, this is what he said in, in, in 2006. So when we um, uh, look more into, experience more into uh, praise, into worship, into even in, in, in uh, expanding our, our taste, because a lot of people are like, oh, this is the kind of style that I like. Uh, but I, I don't like that self. But try to expand it because this is what God has used to touch people in regards to the moves of the Spirit. Uh, even if it's, it's like in the Hebraic, there's something about the Hebraic where it, it almost has like an, an, out, like an extra out to it, uh, 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 you know, an extra push to it in the spiritual. When even the most unmoved person, you know, starts tapping the foot, okay, because there's something in the supernatural. Because Hebrew, uh, and this is not in your notes, by the way, but Hebrew uh, is a very untainted language. All right? Uh, as a matter of fact, the word worship, okay, the actual word worship, the English word worship connotates a pagan deity. Okay? Even the word theology, deus, comes from the word deus in, uh, in Portuguese, uh, deus in, in Greek. And, and it comes from who? Does anyone know who the, where we get that word from? Where word? Zeus. Or it comes from Zeus, okay? That's where we get Zeus, the ultimate god of the Greeks, all right? So even in that sense, okay, uh, the Greek language is tainted with a lot of paganism. When it comes to Hebrew, Hebrew's not tainted. Uh, some scholars, uh, Bible scholars, believe that when we go to heaven, we will be praising and almost mainly in Hebrew. And when you look at the book of Revelation, when you see Jesus, and we're going to see that when we study, uh, I'm hoping to get to it as soon as possible, because we're running out of time. But when we look at the liturgical side of worship, okay, it's like we're going back to the Old Testament. Jesus is in a white robe. Jesus is walking among uh, candles. That does not sound like modern praise of worship. That almost sounds like going back to what? Tabernacle. Back to the temple, all right? So uh, it, there seems to be that sense of, 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 of feeling and understanding that uh, we might be going back to that. It's not a for sure thing, but it's important to look into it, okay? Because it, it, it transcended Latin America. It transcended the African cultures. It transcended the American cultures where we have that influence of Israeli or, or Hebraic dance, all right? So, Acts 2.25, uh, in the Christian Standard Bible, it says, For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. David knew and practiced the presence of the Lord through praise and worship. Therefore, when he faced Goliath, he was not necessarily facing him with a sense of, Oh my God, how am I going to get this done? Okay? And when you see him, how he approached Goliath, he said, I come against you, I come before you 
in the name of the Lord. And so he knew the presence of God was with him. You know, there's something about being in the presence of God when you go through trials and tribulations, but when you go to praise and worship, all that, it's like it doesn't even exist, all right? You become emboldened, all right? Because it's not that you're brainwashing yourself, or as they say, you're faking it till you make it. It's that you are now putting yourself in the realm of the spiritual, and God has not been leaving, uh, he has not left his throne. God is still in his throne, and therefore that gives us that extra, um, that extra co uh, uh, conviction that God is with you. That God is the one that's going to give you this victory, okay? Let's go now, if you can pull up uh, week 9. Alright, we finished. Week 9 of your notes. And we'll start with that. Yes, I do. He said, I saw teach something that uh, the, in the Hebrew, like in English, like car and pet, two different words, but when you put it together, it's carpet, that in the Hebrew, the words cannot be mixed. Correct. They're just like what the word is. Uh, well, yes and no, because remember that we study words like Elohim. Mm -hmm. Okay? Uh, but, uh, yes. Uh, uh, and so the thing is that it, has, it doesn't have any influence of, of a pagan culture. Some people say it does because Abraham came from Mesopotamia, okay? And so he, he carries a lot of that. And we see it a little bit with uh, the Zoroastrians from Iran and stuff like that. But it's not. When you look at the language, it's very clean. It's, it's, it's clean. It's, it's untouched, okay? As a matter of fact, um, I don't want to get political, okay? I, I love different languages. I, I benefit a lot from it. And as a matter of fact, you know how we're, we've been studying a lot of word studies. Okay, we're going to try to get to word studies tonight. But having that, that Spanish background with me helps me understand the Bible a lot, especially when I study Greek. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, Greek just came very easy to me. Latin especially came very easy to me because I was able to understand and comprehend a lot of things because of my Spanish background. Okay? But when it comes to the Hebrew, um, it's not connected with input. And therefore, it can't be like, oh, it's kind of like in this language, it kind of sounds like this. It's not, it's very distinct. And so therefore, it's very clean. And so that's why some people feel that, yeah. But I, 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 I haven't heard this name in a while. <laughs> yes. All right, so let's, let's go on. Thank you. Um, the Theology of Worship, week nine. I do want to emphasize, and uh, Bishop brought, uh, brought this point uh, this past weekend, by the way. Uh, in the service, where, you know, he, he was talking about people who are coming late for praise and worship, all right? He says, it's kind of like the opening act, all right? No, I, I want to just emphasize again that the word service, when we have the church service, it's actually service, it's, it's worship unto the Lord. It's our time to come and give to God. And usually we always think, what's God, what's God going to do for me? And I've already mentioned that before, but I just want to make sure I drive that point home, okay? It's very important that when we are here, uh, we, we are here for, to praise God right at the beginning. It is because we have something to give to the Lord. Notice that in, even in, in looking at the tabernacle, as you come from the very beginning of the entrance to the very fullness where his manifested presence is at, and all the work starts at the beginning with what? With praise, but it's, it's important. Okay, with that sacrifice, with everything. So it's us having that time with God, bringing that forth time with God, bringing a sacrifice of praise to God. Like in the temple, you bring the sacrifice. The temple, you couldn't come with just anything. You could not come empty-handed. And so therefore, you had to come with some kind of sacrifice, which is worship before the Lord. Uh, even if you didn't have money, uh, there were sacrifices in the Old Testament as to that, they, you know, you could... You know, bring maybe a dove or a bird, you know, uh, something that was less expensive or, or other grains. So you couldn't come empty handed. Because in order to experience the presence of God, you also had to bring something to sacrifice. And how sad that in modern times we now have people that feel that they can come to church without even with skipping that whole thing. And it's like they're jumping through the back of the tabernacle and going straight in. 
and, and God saying, hey, that's, that's rude, man. It's like he didn't even say hi. He just came in. And again, it's like the, the time of intimacy between husband and wife is like someone just coming in and getting what they want, and, and the other person is basically just used up. Okay? So it, it's, it's a loving experience between, uh, experience be, between both God and his bride. Okay? Uh, as Psalm 103 calls us to bless the Lord, how can we bless the one who already has everything? Have you think about that? Psalm 103 says, bless the Lord, O my soul. How can, we, how can I bless God if God's the one that blesses me? God doesn't need every, anything at all. He owns everything. How am I going to bless God? Okay? But it is when I bring, or we bring, our spirit, soul, and body, that He may have what? Pleasure in our intimate time with Him. That's how we do it. Okay? In Him, as we sing and are in all in His presence, as we sacrifice our flesh daily and live by the Spirit and obey Him daily with our life. Praise, again, just recapitulating, is a song of faith of what does, of what God has done, okay, or what He can do and will do for His people, His children. Now, as we look at the Psalms, we look at the focus is Israel. But for us, it's the individual child of God, okay, the church of God. The song of thanksgiving. How do we come in into praise and worship? Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Psalm 136, verse 1. Psalm 100, verse 4. Enter His gates with thanksgiving, and into His courts with praise. Be thankful to Him and bless His name. Exodus 17, 15 says, A song of victory in all areas and celebrations is to also include uh, the talit, or the, how we have, you know, the prayer song, okay? Uh, we get that from Exodus 7, 15, where Moses made an uh, uh, altar, and he, he named it Jehovah Nisi, which means the Lord is my banner. We... Praise God for what He can do for us and what He has done for us and what we need Him to do in faith. And one of the number one things is that we need Him to be the lover of our soul, the defender of our life, the victory in our life that we're trying to get and overcome. Psalms 22, 2-4 says, The Lord is my protector. He is my strong fortress. My God is my protection. With Him I am safe. He protects me like a shield and defends me and keeps me safe. He's my Savior. He protects me and saves me from violence. I call to the Lord, and He saves me from my enemies. Praise the Lord. Again, it's a looking of, I have this connection with God, and He watches out for me. He is the Lord, my banner. Psalms 51, 27. Set up a banner in the land. Blow the trumpet among the nations. Again, this is all forms of praise. Now, I want you to start looking, and I try to highlight the words for you, okay? Psalms 51, 27 says banner. Look at Psalms 59, verse 19. It says standard, okay? So, let's look at 59, 19. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a what? Standard. Now, this is from the King James Version. The Darby version says, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a banner. Okay? The Amplified says, a rushing breath and water. Okay? Now, I want you to look here uh, at, at the picture. And those are banners slash standards. Okay? They have a what? A stand. Or it's a, a sheet that is on a pole. It's standing on that pole. Now, why is this connected with praise? How is this connected with praise? Because in uh, ancient times, when the armies would go to war, the first one of the first things that was among them was not just the fighters, but the musicians playing. And among the musicians were flags and standards. Because this is who was telling the other army, this is who you're about to fight. So the Lord is our what? Our standard. He is our banner. Okay, now this is what's interesting when we look into details in, into these various translations. King James says the standard. The Darby uh, translation says banner. 
The Amplified Version said, translates this as the breath and water. This, anytime you see the breath of God, okay, and water, they are symbols of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 2, when you have the descending of the Holy Spirit, what came? A mighty rushing wind. When you see, anytime you see water, it is a symbol of blessing and blessing of the Holy Spirit. Okay? Jesus said, out of your belly will flow what? Rivers of what? Living water. He was, and then the Bible says, and he was referring to the Holy Spirit. Alright? So, when the enemy comes, okay, like a flood, God raises up the standard, raises up the banner, he, he shows the enemy. This is who you're coming up against. You're coming up against my children. And then, the activation of the Holy Spirit in power, in refreshing comes because we are in the presence of God because of praise and worship. That's awesome, okay? Numbers chapter 1 and 2 calls the tribes in Israel to stand behind their banner or standard. Yes, sir? You, you really need to try to be a little bit more enthusiastic and then make sure Okay. <laughs> no, I like that. Like no, the only thing, is, is what gets me excited is anything with the Holy Spirit gets me excited. But what's awesome about this is that um, there's a lot of things when it comes to praise and worship that we think are not important. They're just, uh, some people even criticize it as being theatrics, okay? And they're saying, oh, that, that church is all about psychology and theatrics. I don't know if you heard that criticism before. It says, you know, they, they, they don't, uh, as a matter of fact, I was uh, reading today uh, an author that comes from a very conservative background. And he says, whatever happened to silence? Because... You know, people, there's certain groups of people that worship God, and they worship God in silence, okay? When you look at a lot of the monasteries, the convents, they worship God in silence. As a matter of fact, you take a vow of what? Of silence, so that they can hear from God. And silence is important. Don't get me wrong, silence is important. And to them, the sacredness is that you walk into a building, and it, it's just so tall, okay? Um, and there's silence. You feel the awe of God. And I, I'm not against that. I mean, there should be a sense of reverence when we come into the church. And I think mean, sometimes we are too laid back about it. Okay? As, a, as a matter of fact, in our time, we're too, too laid back. Where people, I mean, they, they just walk in like whatever. But you're walking in to where we worship God, the manifest, manifested presence of God is at. And some people say, well, that's not the church. The church is you and I. The church is, I am the temple of the Holy Spirit. Then you become very egotistical because then you're saying that the place will be gathered together to worship God. That's where his manifested presence is at. Yes, you're right. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there. We have the presence of God. But then at the same time, this is a place that we gather together and we, it's sacred, it's, it's reverential. And so, therefore, we have seen some people from some very different backgrounds. And as soon as they come in, they bow. Not because they bow to worship, you know, the pictures or the building. They bow because they have a certain sense of awe and respect. This is a place where we gather to worship God. It's a sense of respect. Okay? So, I think we should still have some of that. All right? But at the same time, uh, we should also realize that there's more to God, in praising God, not getting stuck with this, just the silence, but looking at this aspect, because see, all this is Bible. And what has happened is, we have certain flavors that people like, and that's where they get stuck. And they feel that all worship, all praise, has to be in silence. Or it has to be with flags, you know, up and down, okay? And, and flags hanging from the roof, and hanging, Flags hanging outside and flags hanging, you know, everywhere. It, it, it looks like you're in a drapery shop or something, okay? Then they overdo that, all right? So it loses its significance, and it almost looks uh, circus-like instead of being genuine, all right? So I think that's what happens. So in Numbers 1 and 2, we see how God calls the tribes of Israel to stand behind their banner, behind their standard, okay? In Psalms 2, 4, again, and I mentioned this when we looked at the prayer shop, uh, it, it talks about how uh, his banner over us is love. Psalms 20 verse 5, he says, We will sing for joy over your victory. And in the name of our God, we will set up what? Banners. Okay? Here's where we have, we 
start to develop what we call in modern times what we have on flag ministry. Okay? In Psalm 66, verse 2, the NIV says, Sing to the Lord of his name. Make his name glorious, or make his praise glorious. All right? Part of using the flag, part of using whatever, whether it be the lights, whether it be whatever you want to use, okay? Uh, we do it because we're making his praise glorious. How else are you going to make it glorious? Glorious means that what? You're making a big deal about praising God. And it's, it's almost like having a parade. You're what? You're making a big deal. You have flowers. You have, you know, uh, uh, you know events. You, you have displays. You have loud music. You know, you have banners. You have everything. Because you're making something what? Glorious. You're making an event glorious. Psalm 60 verse 4. This is from the Darby translation. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, that it may be displayed because of your truth. Now, why? The banner must be displayed for what? The truth. It's not just swinging banners to swing banners. The banners, and we're going to look at it uh, probably, hopefully, next week, okay? They have to uh, symbolize something about the nature of God, the praise, or in their uh, spiritual warfare. Isaiah 31 9. Their stronghold will fall because of terror. At the sight of the battle standard, their commanders will panic, declares the Lord. So here God is saying, when you're about to go into war, raise that standard. Raise that banner. Because they're gonna see who's who you're with. I'm with you. And when they see you, they're gonna panic. And again, it's like when, when I mentioned the shofar, right? So people say, why will the shofar? Because you might not know it, but the demons know it, and they tremble. And the demons see the flags, and they tremble. They hear the shofar, and they tremble. They hear the timbrels and the tambourines, and they tremble. Because it's anointed music to make warfare against him, but bring glory to our God. Okay? And it reminds me of another song that says, Let God arise, and his enemies be scattered. His enemies are scattered when we lift up and the manifested presence of God comes in, okay? Praise may include dancing, okay? Uh, I sent you uh, uh, to uh, <coughs> Pastor Mike as well. Uh, if, if you can look on the website, okay? There's different examples of dancing, okay? And some of them, you might, if you're not familiar with it, you're going to find it a little comical, all right? It's okay. But we have different forms of dancing in the church, uh, let, now let's play with some words, all right? Uh, and again, this is referencing the strong uh, Hebrew and Greek uh, dictionary, okay? Which, there are your reference numbers, they are in green, so you can look them up and verify them as well. So we have orkemai, okay? And this is a Greek word, okay? And look, before we even look at it, and I put it down there where it says orchestrated, you see that? When you have an orchestra, why does an orchestra sound good? Because there's different parts, but they're all playing at the right time, at the right speed, and in tune. It goes what? Together. It is a set sheet of music that is being played. No one just shows up and plays whatever. Correct? It's orchestrated. So this type of dance in the Bible is referring to a dance that is orchestrated. It has steps, it, have, it has movements. It has been prepared ahead of time. So therefore, there's an element of preparedness, of practice, of thought, of prayer, of careful consideration. How am I moving? Is this, this move glorify God? Does it go with the praise that we're about to sing? Or how you give it careful consideration, you put it together, okay? Uh, Mekola, okay, and Koros. It, it, it's more of a dance of round dance or dancing. This is where it's not necessarily uh, complicated steps, but it's something that as a group, we can all get together and dance. And one of the dances that I put up there, uh, you see it, I think it's called uh, Jews and Christians Dance Together, all right? And it's pretty neat. They're in there, and it's a common uh, Jewish dance where they get in a circle and they're dancing, all right? It's simple that everyone can join in. Whereas the Akomai is something that is more complicated, more in the talent field, 
okay? Uh, you're a musician, you play well because you practice, right? It takes time, it takes practice, all right? But if you're not a musician, you can, you can clap. You can clap along, you can sing along, all right? But mekola is something that you can dance along to. Everyone should be able to dance as well, and this is a type of dance where everyone can join too, okay? Uh, notice the attention to the modesty, by the way. These are some of the, the apparel for some of the praise uh, and, and worship uh, dance teams, all right? There's a sense of semblance to Revelation chapter 7, if you can look it up in your own time. I keep on uh, re referencing that because even in heaven, the way we worship God, it symbolizes a lot the way we start seeing some people start doing things on their own. Now, a lot of these dance groups are not in liturgical background churches, but yet they start dressing in liturgical manners like a priest would. When you see our ordinations, we wear the, the white uh, owl, which starts looking very much like this. Uh, I've seen it, and, and we're, I don't want to jump ahead of myself, but there's other people who are move a, they move a lot in the prophetic realm, okay? And, and I think about people like uh, Prophetess Juanita Bynum. I don't know if you've heard of her before. Powerful woman of God. Powerful woman of God. But, uh, you know, my, my kids are like, oh, yeah, she, she's scary. <laughs> and my, most, prof, and most people who work in the prophetic are a little bit on the scary side, okay? But being that she's a woman, they, they start having this sense of, you need to hear me. This is the message that I have from the Lord. Take it seriously. But other people are looking at them like, oh, you're a cute. You know, why are you hot? You know, and so they have this sense where they start even wearing uh, an owl like gown, okay? And without being part of the liturgical background, they start dressing like this because, you know, it, it symbolizes. I believe it's part of the Holy Spirit giving that, that inspiration. There's an a older uh, faith healer, her name is Catherine Coleman. Oh, I almost forgot her name. Catherine Coleman, she's an awesome woman of God. From the 1960s, 70s, and early 80s. Okay, Catherine Pullman, as a matter of fact, she is what formed a lot of Benny Hinn's ministry, healing ministry. And God used her a lot in the healing ministry. But when you see her and the way she dressed herself, she dressed in a long, white dress, usually with long sleeves and, and draping sleeves because she didn't want to draw attention to herself, but she wanted people to see the move of God through the healing power of the Holy Spirit. And so there, there is a call that when you have this intense movement of worship and, and praise, we have to be careful that we are moving in such a way or we are presenting ourselves as priests of the Lord that's not drawing attention to ourselves, all right? Or that we don't give people the opportunity to fall in the flesh, all right? Uh, here we have uh, an orchestra, an example of an orchestrated dance to the left, okay? Again, look at the dress, by the way. This is interesting. Uh, orchestrated dance or dancing in the spirit, okay? Uh, the, the people here to the right, by the way, uh, that is out of a revival in, in Toronto, Canada, by the way. It was a charismatic revival. Uh, powerful move of the Holy Spirit where people were dancing, uh, but it was not orgomai. It was not orchestrated, okay? And so we, we have them um, uh, where people say, you can have this orchestrated form of praising God, but you can also have this form of dancing that is not necessarily orchestrated or prepared. It is an actual manifestation of the Holy Spirit, where people are in such uh, awe and ecstasy of the Holy Spirit that they have reactions, whether they're shaking, they fall, or they run, or they dance, or they, they, they tremble, all right? Uh, and we have that here. In spirit-filled communities, especially in older denominations such as uh, holiness or apostolic faith, uh, which have classical Pentecostal con uh, connections. Uh, this is a very worded sentence, all right? If you want to know more about it, talk to uh, your dean and take the Holy Spirit class, all right? Because we talk about that in, in detail. Uh, but when they come from this background, they still have a lot of these influences where they believe that this type of praise is when the believer is receiving the blessing. Or in Spanish, they say that, Tiene mucha bendición, está en bendición. And the person is overwhelmed by a trance or a euphoric state in praise to God. Uh, they're very critical, by the way, of Algomai. 
They don't like orchestrated dances. They say, that's, that's fate. You know, we're supposed to praise God in the spirit. You know, of course, there's lack of theological understanding because we just look at it. These are biblical terms. There's nothing wrong with that. Even from the Old Testament, they, they were orchestrated. When you have uh, um, Miriam, who was a prophetess, sister of Moses, orchestrated a dance before the Lord. They were not dancing like this because the Holy Spirit was not there. And yet it pleased God. And she prophesied to the Lord. Okay, so, but this, it's not to discount this either. All right, uh, I'm going to show you how both are legit and both are, are biblical. All right, so let's go on. It should not, uh, they, they believe it should not be mimicked and falsely done in the flesh. Not in the trance state, okay? In Acts chapter 2, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit had believers in a drunken like state of ecstasy. When you look at the book of, uh, of Acts and you look at the falling of the Holy Spirit, uh, Peter, the Bible says, had to stand up to explain what was going on. What does that tell you? What do you mean he had to stand up? That guy was bored. Okay? Now some people ridiculously say, no, it was all in order. They were all speaking in tongues. And he, he was sitting down on a chair. That's why he had to stand up. I don't think so. Because I don't think someone that's going to be considered drunk, as the, the, the people who are mocking them, they're saying, these people are drunk, man. They're wasted. They're all so full of the Holy Spirit, but they didn't know it was the Holy Spirit. They just thought, these people are so wasted and why? They're drunk. All right? Peter was obviously in a very ecstatic, drunken state in the Holy Spirit. So he topples up. He's trying to stand up and explain what happened. Obviously, it was, it was something similar to this experience. All right? There is partial truth, like I told you, to this. As a believer, uh, they may be overwhelmed to a trance-like euphoric state, okay, embrace and its unique and profound experience in the presence of God. Now, if, if, if you're looking, if you're a student and you're online, okay, you're taking this course later, please don't stop the video because you're from this background and you feel like we're making fun of you, right? We're, we're looking at this, uh, this perspective is a theology of worship taking the whole entire church in general. So I hope you realize we're looking at the whole church. Whereas in other Bible uh, schools or Bible colleges, they only have one perspective. See? You're blessed in this matter, right? Because we're looking at the whole thing. We're not just looking at it from the charismatic or the Pentecostal or the Baptist or, or the Anglican. We're looking at the whole thing here. Okay? So let's look at it carefully. Let's look at it biblically. All right? Uh, Acts chapter uh, 22, verse 17. It says, It happened when I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple that I fell into a what? Now, if we were to be critical of this, we would then be critical of an apostle and say, man, this apostle was freaky. He was emotional. He believed in theatrics because he fell into a trance. He was emotionally weak because he's, he's there praying, but all of a sudden he's in a trance? What's up with that? The Darby Bible translation translates it this way. And I was praying in the temple that I became in what? Ecstasy. It is possible to be in such a deep state of praising God that it takes us to an ecstatic level where we are elevated to a trance-like state. A drunken soup rocks, okay? Uh, the Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines ecstasy and trance as a state of overwhelming emotion. Especially rapturous delight. Be in a trance, especially, now interesting how the Webster Dictionary adds this, a mystic or prophetic trance, all right? Uh, I remember when I was in a, in a prophetic conference, and, and there was this gentleman, and, and, and there was people dancing, by the way, in the altar, but there was this gentleman, and he was just stuck with his hand like this, and he kept on shaking with his hand like this, all of a catatonic state, and, um, the brother who was, was preaching, he was a minister from uh, the Morris Cirillo uh, Ministries. And they move a lot of the spirit, but this is very peculiar to, to them because they don't see this a lot in America. And he says, God is telling me that this man is experiencing this right here. Don't touch it. And some people right away wanted to move him and get up to sit down. And he says, but this is going on because he's reminding us. God is reminding us 
that this moment is to focus on Him and praise Him. We're rushing because you want to hear us. You want to hear the superstar preacher, but we're here for Him. Oh, that was amazing. And that was so humbling of that man of God because in reality, this guy was kind of stopping the flow of things. <laughs> he was right with his head like this, you know. And he says, no, this is of God. And sometimes right away we want to stop people because we want things to just work picture perfect. We don't want people to freak out, okay? And, and you know, it's like Rock Carpenter and, and, and Jim Brady are some of the preachers that I, I laugh a lot at because they're like, you know, I want to scare you. I want to freak you out. And, you know, they say, if I don't freak you out, I'm not doing something right. Because if you can in reality, Jesus did not hide nor, nor compromise anything, even among the lost people. He was very frank. He allowed the freedom of the spirit. He allowed the manifestations of, the, of, of, of demonic spirits because he never said, well, we don't want people that don't know God to be afraid. No, on the contrary. He said it didn't happen because it testifies to the reality of good and evil. Okay? So here we see how people can go into that trance life state. It is possible to fall into a trance while praying. It is also highly possible for a believer to also experience this with praise as it is an intense experience that involves the emotional and physical senses. I guess some people say, well, all this is emotionalism. But that's how God made us. God made us spirit, soul, and body. If we are to say, well, God said that we are to worship Him in spirit and in truth, when that's the case, then you would just stand still and not mention a word because your spirit is inside. Your spirit is not your body. And why are we clapping hands? Why are we singing? That's your body. I thought you said you only praise God in spirit. Because right now you're using your body. So if you were to just use spirit, you couldn't even talk. But see, we use spirit, soul, which has our emotions, and they manifest in our what? In our body. And having that encounter with God, when we transcend that, it is so powerful and profound, we cannot understand it. And we have to be very careful because we cannot be critical of people who are manifesting the presence of God in a way that we're not used to. I've seen, I've seen crazy manifestations, I'll be honest with you. And the first thing I do when I see is I laugh. I'm going to be honest with you. My wife says, you always laugh at the wrong times. And I go, I, I'm one of those. I'm one of those. I'll be honest with you. I laugh at the wrong times. In bad situations, I end up smiling and laughing. I go, it's not that I'm being rude. The thing is this, is that I rejoice. I rejoice. I rejoice. I'm like, oh, cool. That's awesome. Touch them more, you know? Awesome. You know, where people are like, oh, you should be laughing. Let's stop being so serious, too. Rejoice that God is touching them. But don't freak out. That's awesome. Um, you know, there, there are some people that, for whatever reason, uh, let me give you a quick, quick story about a manifestation in, in the spirit in regards to laughing and rejoicing in the spirit. And some people are not familiar with that. We don't see that a lot. And it's kind of, we kind of saw a rush of the revival during the 90s. Uh, with Kenneth Hagin and, and, and uh, Rima Institute and, and uh, the Pensacola Brownsville Revival and the, the Toronto Revival, we're starting to lose it now. So when it happens, people freak out. Okay? Um, but quick story, okay? Uh, there was a pastor's wife here in El Paso, and uh, the congregation is very conservative. And they went to a women's retreat in, in Ridos, I believe. And they had a, a woman, Lila Sarkin, as a matter of fact, she's one of the ministers. Uh, by the way, she leads five ministry and intercession. And uh, she ministers with Daniel Poneda and, and Reinhard Bonke, by the way. But she was here in Milo, so she went. And God touched her in such a way that she fell and she left for hours. For hours. Now, quick story. She had just had a baby not too long ago. They had just taken over a ministry. Taking over ministries is hard. For those of you that we even have a position in ministry, and sometimes it's overwhelming. I imagine taking over a whole congregation. And then having some people that don't like you or having some problems, you make your own mistakes, okay? We all make our own mistakes, right? And, and then having people point that finger on you. And, and some of them are valid, some of them are not valid. But she kind of fell into the baby blues, okay? Uh, what we call a postpartum depression. 
but she was still serving God and everything. But it, man, it was tough. It, it was a reality. But boom, God touched her in such a way where she was praising God, and she laughed for hours. Now, when you look at the science part of it, there's a healing aspect when you laugh. It releases oxytocin in your body, and it actually produces healing in your body. Uh, she got up like a brand new woman of God. Why? Because she dared to praise God even when it was hard. Okay? Even when it was hard. And what would have happened if people would have been like, oh, pick her up. Uh, she's been already there for like two minutes. <laughs> she needed that time to just be before the presence of God. Alright? So, let's go on. It involves everything. However, it is possible that in the origin of praise, it wasn't in a trance state, but it was orchestrated with our full effort of the body, not a holy rupture of spiritual possession to force you to move and come to an ecstatic combo of spirit and body, a supernatural experience. So it could be that you were just being part of what everyone was doing, the goros part, right? The choir type of thing. We were just joining in together, and all of a sudden, boom, you just broke out in your own thing, all right? This is what happened to David. You know that famous story where David was, uh, the, the ark was coming in, all right? And just, just make, because I'm a Bible nerd and I, I can't stand when people misquote the Bible and they misinterpret the Bible, right? And there's a lot of people that say, oh yeah, David in the Old Testament, he got naked. And he was not a Buddhist, all right? He did not get naked. He was wearing a certain royal and priestly things. He took it off because he was in the way. He couldn't dance before God. He took it off so he could dance and move, all right? But he wasn't stripped naked. He wasn't like Adam and Eve making, all right? So just to get that out of the way. All right, so below we see David go from it being his own joyous response in praise. And we have this story in 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 14. And it says, and David was dancing before the Lord with all his might. Now this kind of refutes dancing in the spirit or being in that trance Because when it says in all his might, it doesn't mean that he was possessed and he didn't know what he was doing. He knew what he was doing. He was doing it with his full might, with his full orchestrated steps, okay? Where it was a mambo, a cha-cha, I don't know, you know? He had his own movements and he was going at it, all right? And the two steps, no, I don't know. But he was praising God orchestrated way. The, the Levites were dancing and praising God. It was orchestrated. It was a chorus type of, of praise. But... This was David's own effort to dance, and with all his might, not a trance-like state, yet it led to a euphoric state. Now, why am I telling that it led to a euphoric state? Because when you keep reading it, and you compare uh, 2 Samuel, and then you also read the Kings and the Chronicles, and you look at the whole story, there's two words that stick out when it describes um, uh, Samuel, I mean, when it describes David dancing. The two Greek, uh, Hebrew words are rakat and karat. And there are the reference numbers. One is to spring about wildly or for joy. Karad is to dance in a worldly motion. And I'll tell you this, I have been blessed to be able to just praise God in such a way. I almost feel like a tornado when I'm praising. I'm just spinning and I'm spinning and I'm spinning. I'm, I don't even know how my feet are on the floor. But I'm spinning so far, I don't, lose, I don't get vertical, I don't get dizzy. I just praise God. Now, I've been in that situation before where it becomes euphoric. It goes from being orchestrated, but he went from being orchestrated, Goro's type, to a trance-like state. Because the deepness was that like, it's like running and bouncing and trolling. Okay? Almost like that Tasmanian uh, devil from Looney Tunes, all right? So it is possible that we go from an orchestrated way to a trance-like way. Okay? Uh, praise him with a song. We also have different forms of testimony. Uh, the songs of testimony. Now we're going to look at the different forms of praises. We can sing a song of testimony and witness. The song of God has our, of what God has already done for us. Psalm 71, 15-16. My mouth will tell of your righteousness and your salvation all day long. Though I cannot sum them up, I will come because of the mighty acts of the Lord God. I will proclaim your righteousness, yours alone. Psalm 22, 22, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. I will rejoice in the very center of the congregation. So we are to praise God individually. We are to praise God always. But there's also a time to come together and gather, congregate, and worship God together. And Bishop brought that up this Sunday, all right? 
It, it, you can say, I can have church here at home all by myself. Hmm, maybe, but you are now refusing to assemble and congregate with others, and there's a power in that unity as well. Okay? The crowds of song of petition or prayer and help, here's where you get the word Hosanna. Okay? Uh, the, this is a Greek word, and it says, coming in adoration and pleading, O saints. So it's, it's kind of like, uh, you know, coming before God, you have a need, but you're also giving adoration to God, but at the same time asking for something. All right? Matthew 21, 9 says, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Although it was a plea to save, it comes with a touch of admiration. Okay? And this is because of the Roman oppression. But it can also be a songs in the modern church where we have adoration of God, but at the same time mean something from God. Okay? We also have uh, songs of edification and admonition. Uh, there's Romans 14, 19, Colossians 3, 16, where we are to uh, let the word of God dwell in us richly, but we're also to teach and admonish each other. And one of the ways we admonish each other is to sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. Now notice how it distinguishes them. Some are the songs, some are the hymns, and some are just spiritual. So remember how we looked at what is praise? What is our worship? They're not the same thing. And then sometimes we think that, you know, if a song is slow, it's worship. It's not. It's not. If a song is fast enough, it is praise. No, it's not. But just because it's not praise or worship doesn't mean it can't be sung either. Do you understand that? Because here we have songs that are spiritual. Now I have a picture there of, of, of a minister helping a, a brother. By the way, when you go out and admonish people to change, to repent, you have to have that part of restoration. You're not just knocking people with a brick on the head, all right? You have to form that, that ability to have uh, reparation, to restore. You have to be part of that restoration. Songs of praise, uh, songs of, uh, of and, and praise must edify and admonish, warm, uh, firmly correct, okay? One of the guys, by the way, uh, that I think, if you can look it up, I didn't send you that song, but if you can, please look it up. It's here in your notes. His name is Keith Green. Two minutes? Ah, okay. Uh, he's, he sang a song of uh, admonition, and it's called Asleep in the Night. Look it up. It's really good. It's talking about um, the need to uh, admonish and wake up from your super and praise God and worship Him. Uh, there's also Oceans uh, by Hillsong. You're an overcomer by Landisa. It's admonishing, but it's also uh, edifying you as well. All right. Uh, we're going to stop there because we have two minutes left. All right. Ah, all right. We need to finish. Let's go real fast next time, all right? I think we did good this time, though. But let's, let's go as fast as we can next time, all right? Uh, Thank you, Lord, for having us here this evening. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, and we just thank you for being so good to us. We ask you, Lord, that your work continues to do something great in our life, that we are growing in you, and we're growing to know you more as we, as we do our assignments, as we're fasting, as we're reading this literature from, from uh, A.W. Tozer, from Oswald Chambers, that, Lord, it brings conviction to our hearts to be worshipers, and, and praisers of a true, sincere, contrite heart. We love you, God. We worship you. And Lord, like that scripture says, we raise up the banner. And Lord, that your Holy Spirit just rush and refresh us and fight for us. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I bless this class and students and this college. Amen and amen. God bless you all. We'll see you next week. And stay on top of yourself. There's pens there. Please take them with you. Uh, there are extra pens. I have some assignments. I'll give them to you in just a little bit. All right. Thank you. God bless you. What was the name of the prophet that you said, Corina? Juanita. Oh, Juanita. Juanita Bynum. B-Y-N-U-M. Uh, she's very hard for just to give you a heads up. Juanita Bynum. Yeah, but she's not going to be uh, one to uh, make me feel nice and comfortable. She's not, she's not Joel Olsen.